today he's going to uh, to tell us about yeah the fear in society and how you know where we're going with that. I give you uh, Frank Ferredi Ferredi in fear and security in the age of terror. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'm really uh, glad to be talking about freedom here because this is Freedom Week in Holland. Uh, I've been sp I spent the last few years working on a book, uh, which is really the history of freedom. I'm very interested in the way that ideas about being free uh, and the way that we live freedom have crystallized over the centuries. And one of the things that I've noticed uh, as, as a recurrent issue that uh, is probably more important today than in the past, but it's a continuity, are two very interesting developments. The one is that um, people find it very difficult to live freely. You know, we all talk about freedom as being really important, and uh, you have loads of declarations, pieces of paper, that talk about how important freedom is, <laughs> and how we must fight for it and guard it. But when a push comes to shove in everyday life, people are scared of freedom and very often find it very difficult to, uh, to live genuinely free because freedom can be a very scary thing, as I'm sure many of you have experienced it time and time again. And certainly, you know, when uh, recently I've been reading some of the existentialist literature, people like Jean-Paul Sartre, on the subject, you can really understand why people are often scared of freedom. And the second thing that I've discovered in my work, uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by, is that if you look at the centuries, people have spent far more time inventing reasons as to why freedom is not a good idea, or why freedom has got to be limited, or why freedom needs to be rationed, than in arguing for freedom. And in fact, what's very interesting is if you look at human history, the arguments against freedom were developed before arguments for freedom were. In other words, before we had an idea of real freedom, there were all these books from Plato onwards, uh, Greek philosophers writing you know, lots of essays as to why freedom is a very dangerous phenomenon. We really got to be very, very careful and why censorship is really morally an imperative that we need to keep the public away from all these dangerous or potentially dangerous ideas. And I think that uh, emphasis where we spend a lot of time arguing why freedom needs to be limited is today one of the biggest challenges that we face in Holland as much as in England or in France and in America. Because although on paper everybody swears on freedom, in practice it's a little bit different. In fact, when I look around the European uh, sort of world today and look at the Western world, Generally, the main attitude, the dominant attitude on freedom is summed up by the expression, I don't know if you've got a Dutch equivalent of this, I believe in freedom, but. You know, I believe in freedom, but. And the but usually trumps the freedom. Because as you know, when people say but, what's really important is what goes after but. Right? Usually, I believe in freedom is like a you know, I have to look good, so I have to say I believe in freedom. But what I really mean is I don't. And certainly not for them, not for you, and certainly not in these circumstances. There's always this tension uh, that I've noticed occurring in our societies. And what you really have, and you get this all the time, you open up a newspaper and people will say, oh, I believe in freedom, but... I don't believe in the right of a Turkish minister to talk to people in Rotterdam. Not in this instance. Or I believe in freedom, but I don't think it's right to criticize Islam in that particular instance. Or the other way around, you know, I believe in freedom, but not if it offends people. And in, in, in Anglo-American societies, you've got this situation where in the universities, there is now a, an argument that basically says that you know, freedom of speech is actually dangerous because it allows people to be offended. So people on campus say, in universities say, I believe in freedom, but if 
it, not if it offends some people on campus. In other words, even in a university, the idea that you, need, you are exposed to criticism uh, is seen as potentially not worth it. It's a dangerous thing. In other words, what they are really saying is that the right not to be offended is more important than the right of free speech. And when you make a long list of all the circumstances in which it's not okay to, uh, to say what you want to, where it's not okay to be free, it is really worrying. I was in California recently, and after I gave a talk, uh, I saw some students protesting, and the protest that they had, there was a big banner, something that really shook me up, and on the banner it said, hate speech is free speech, and free speech is hate speech. And the idea was that somehow, the very fact that you speak freely inevitably uh, represents somehow the projection of power. It represents hate, and therefore it needs to be policed, and it needs to be curbed in some shape or form. And that seems to me to be a very uh, important argument. And in fact, what I find is that you can go to uh, uh, sort of many parts of Europe, and inevitably, in an audience like this, somebody will say, I believe in free speech, but I believe in equality as being more important. In other words, there's an idea that somehow freedom needs to be balanced against equality, because from their perspective, the two don't go together. And when I say, well, why should freedom and equality need to be balanced? Why, why do they need to be contradictory? They will tell me, well, you know, Frank, what's the use of free speech or freedom for if you're poor? Right? What's the point of, of, of freedom if you're poor? But of course, forgetting the fact that throughout human history, it was the poor that struggled to get the freedom of speech in the first place. It was precisely because the powerless realized that unless they have freedom, unless they have a voice, they will never be able to achieve or acquire anything else. So what I'm, one of the things I want to talk to you about, what I'm really concerned about, is this idea that freedom needs to be balanced against another value, that freedom needs to be traded in for another value, that somehow there is freedom here, but there's a value that's potentially more important, that maybe equality is more important than freedom, or maybe the right not to be offended is more important than free speech. The reason why that's important to me, as somebody with uh, fairly strong uh, sort of liberty-related ideals, is because if you actually think that freedom needs to be traded off against security, this is what a lot of our counter-terrorism experts tell us, that you cannot have a secure society unless we give up a little bit of freedom, you know, we cannot find a terrorist unless we become less free. That's the argument. You know, if that's really true, what we are really saying is that freedom has become a second-order value, a second-order value, and security has become a first-order value. So not only are we saying that freedom and security are contradictory, we're lowering, reducing freedom to something that's less important than equality, security, or 101 different things that you can dream up, and people do dream up against uh, sort of freedom, this idea of uh, freedom uh, balanced by security. And in, in a sense, uh, what concerns me is that what we are losing sight of is a very basic proposition, something that I passionately believe in, which is that freedom is a value that's good in and of itself. That freedom is not something that you kind of trade off, but freedom is a value that's good in and of itself. Because if you think that freedom can be traded off or exchanged for some other value, in other words, if you think that freedom is divisible, then what you end up is really what I suppose you could call the McDonaldization of freedom. You know, when you go to a McDonald's shop, you get these bite-sized little bits, nuggets of, of, of bite-sized food, and freedom becomes reduced to something very, very similar that you can just give away, exchange in that particular way. In my work, I call the McDonaldization of freedom uh, the freedom security trade-off. That's basically what it is. And you'll find that politicians will demand this trade-off. Uh, it needs to occur. And 
In a sense, one of the things that we find uh, is that the assumption is based on the idea that if you give a little bit of freedom away, just give it a little bit of freedom away, will be that much more secure. Right? That Holland or England will become much more secure if we, for example, um, prevent people from watching jihadist videos. Right? Uh, if we can censor certain types of expressions, we'll be so much more secure as a result of that. And the tragedy is, and something that people don't notice until too late, is that the minute you go down that road, you end up in a situation where you begin by saying, okay, we'll give up a bit of freedom, a little bit of freedom, so that people, for example, are prevented from listening to radical Islamist preachers. But it never stops there. Because the day after, they come along and say, oh yeah, that was okay, that was the beginning, but we still need a bit less freedom. A little bit less freedom. And you go down, and then after a year you'll find, but bit by bit you're giving up a lot more of your freedom. If you look at, for example, in America, where you begin with the Patriot Act and all these laws, you end up in a situation where after a while, you know, governments are asking that you know, sort of almost your private life online becomes uh, available to the, to the examination and the exploration of governments. So this is really, it seems to me, to be a, a really crucial ideal. And the reason why I think it's worth thinking about this freedom security trade-off is because the logic of that is the belief that freedom, rather than being a source of our strength, Rather than making us strong as a society, freedom is a source of our weakness. That freedom makes us less able to fight our enemies. If you're really free, how could we fight the terrorists? If you really believe it, if you really have free speech, you know, sort of how could we prevent uh, sort of people from not being offended? And this point was really summed up to me quite well. Um, this exchange process by a little comment made by Dame Eliza Manningham Bullock, who was the head of MI5 in England. And this is what she says. Some erosion of what we value may be necessary to improve the chances of our citizens not being blown away or blown apart as they go around their daily lives. So in other words, what she's saying is that we have to give up the values that we really cherish in order not to get blown up the correlation between the two. And what she's really saying is that it is our civil liberties, it is our freedoms that, make, that acts as an obstacle to fight terrorism effectively. In other words, if you had less freedom, we'd be able to defeat terrorism tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. That's the logic of the argument. And it seems to me that once we adopt this opportunistic approach towards freedom, where we basically see it as a source of our weakness, then it loses its inner content. It no longer has an integrity. It becomes almost like a paper freedom that we ourselves become very, very uncomfortable with. And I think that's the challenge that European societies have today, realizing that actually freedom is not a source of weakness, but it's our main source of strength. It's, it's what makes us strong. And if there's, a, if, if there's a problem in Europe today, it's not that we have too much freedom, but we have too little freedom. There's a lot more freedoms that we can aspire to achieve and to gain. The arguments that uh, uh, people are putting forward in demanding the trade-off of freedom for security are actually founded upon a, upon a, a philosophical uh, uh, sort of series of arguments that was put forward most eloquently by the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, writing in the, in the uh, 16th, uh, uh, writing in the 17th century, had this idea that in order for order to be maintained, in order for society to be run effectively, we needed to use fear as a way of, of, of limiting people's aspirations. And one of the things that uh, Hobbes tried to do was to, in a sense, limit the aspiration for freedom. Because remember, he's writing at a time after the English Civil War where people did demand and did struggle for freedom. The way he tried to 
limit the desire for freedom was by making people scared, by basically preying upon people's fear, particularly their fear of death, their desire for security. He believed that if people could, could understand that their security was on the line, then they really would be quite prepared to give up their freedoms. Hobbes also understood that it wasn't simply enough to scare people because that's a little bit too artificial. What he realized was that you needed to get people to, in a sense, become uh, paralyzed or insecure about dealing with uncertainty with the future. He realized that the way you get people to be really scared and fearful, to really ignore their freedoms, is if you can get them to think about what the future was going to be like, the uncertainties of the future. Because one of the uh, points that Hobbes made is that the fear of the unknown was actually much more paralyzing than any tangible fear that you come up against. If you see something that scares you in the eyes, that's easier to deal with than the unknown. Because when you think about the unknown and about the future, these are fears that are unbounded. You know, our imagination, our fantasies can think about those fears uh, that have not yet happened, the unknown or the unknowable. And that's really what often works in, in that kind of powerful way. And what Hobbes did was basically put forward a proposition that what we need to do is to get people to dare less, to risk less, to experiment less, to almost to kind of voluntarily restrain their aspiration for freedom. And if you look at his writings, he does put forward a very systematic philosophy that almost tries to give a moral content to fearing. To fear death is a morally important imperative. It's an important contribution, something that becomes increasingly important today, because as you know, in the 21st century, the way that we scare ourselves, the way that we manage to uh, get people to forget about their freedoms is by always projecting the unknown, the fear of the unknown. That was something that the Bush administration did really well in the United States, where they basically told us that what we have to be scared about is not what we know, but what we don't know. And they went a step further and they said, what we have to be scared about is not just simply what we don't know. In other words, not just simply scared of the unknown. We also have to be scared of the unknown unknowns. That was a, a new leap forward in the way that uncertainty was posed, the unknown unknowns. These are things that we don't even know that we don't know, right? They are really extremely scary. And, you know, sort of, because uh, if you do that, you know, then it makes perfect sense to launch a war against Iraq on the basis that we think that there might be, maybe, possibly, weapons of mass destruction. Right? And, uh, you know, when um, the Bush administration were asked, well, you know, guys, you know, where are the weapons of mass destruction? They said, you know, sort of the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. In other words, that the scary thing was that we haven't got the evidence. That's even scarier. If we had found the weapons of mass destruction, that would be much, you know, much less scary than the fact that they didn't find it. Because it just shows you how clever these people are in kind of hiding it. And that kind of logic of the unknown unknowns is something, as I argued a number of places, has become quite central in the way that we think about these particular developments. I think just jumping forward, uh, what I want to suggest to you is that you know, politicians who are you know, sort of optimistic about the future do not, use to, do not have to use fear. If you look at human history, those politicians who had some plan about the future, some transformative vision of what the world could be like, do not need to rely on fear in this way. And that was the the great thing about Roosevelt, who came up with the four freedoms that uh, I think some of you may be celebrating. If you remember in this respect, what Roosevelt said in his inaugural address in 1933, when he talked about future possibilities, was that the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. And when he said that, he was, 
kind of planning out the New Deal, a new way of organizing American society. And you find that throughout uh, politics, whenever politicians are looking forward with, with kind of in a future-oriented way, they do not rely on fear. They don't have to remind us of terror. Now, Hobbes would have been very happy with what's happening today. He would have been delighted by the way that politics has evolved in the European context because he recognized two important things. He first of all recognized that it was important to get people to be worried about the future and uncertainty and, and, and to be particularly worried about the unknown. And also what Hobbes did, and this is something people often don't recognize, he would have been delighted by the fact that in Europe, and in America particularly, we don't feel comfortable with free speech anymore. Right? Uh, Hobbes wrote at length about the dangers of free speech. He basically argued that the worst thing that happened to England was all these universities where people had their own ideas, where everybody had an opinion. And he argued that free speech is the death of order. Today, in European societies, we are beginning to go down the same road. If you look at the number of uh, sort of laws against free speech, the number of so-called hate laws, the number of laws against Holocaust denial, the number of uh, uh, laws against inciting religious blasphemy, you know, we are really uncomfortable. And on university campuses in the Anglo-American world, the policing of language is totally institutionalized. There are words you just cannot use and you cannot say. And people argue that this is a progressive, it's actually called progressive, sort of step in the right direction, that we limit our right to express ourselves. I mean, talk about progress. You know, this was historically the most reactionary, the most conservative way of, of, of running a, a society and public life. So Hobbes would have been really pleased with that because he understood that this is the way you paralyze society uh, and developing their cultural life. You know, if you look at history, you'll find that freedom and democracy and taking risk with, with freedom go hand in hand. The first society that actually took freedom seriously, albeit in a limited way, was Athens, in ancient Athens. And the wonderful thing about the Athenians was that they understood that there's a, core, a close relationship between an argumentative political culture, a demos where you argued and debated, and democracy, and the taking of risk. These were three qualities that they all understood. It was a very basic idea of freedom because, as you know, Athenian society still had slaves and freedom wasn't extended to women or to most of the people, but the, it's the crystallization, it's the beginning. It was something that they could do because they believed that the future was theirs. It was something they could occupy and make their own. If you jump ahead, we come to the Renaissance period, the uh, Italian city-states and the republics, and there too you will find a real understanding that freedom was essential for the conduct of public life, that it was a value that was important in and of itself because we could only be citizens, democratically accountable citizens, if we could be genuinely free. And you have the ideas, the early Republican ideas of liberties kicking in and developing at that particular time. And as we go down the road, you'll find that in societies where democracy is taken seriously, so too is freedom. And so too is a, is a, is a, a reluctance to close the future and to worry about future uncertainties. And that seems to me that's a very important lesson. And the reason why it's an important lesson is because freedom ultimately depends upon human agency. We recognize that to be free you know, is not based upon a piece of paper that you get. You know, freedom implies the freedom to change the world. Freedom implies not deferring to fate, not being fatalistic. Freedom implies a preparedness to engage with uncertainty. Freedom implies the fact, it's a very simple fact, that you and I, despite all of our difficulties, are prepared to make choices, 
and live with the consequences of those choices. It's a very simple proposition, but it's in practice not always so easy. Just think of the number of times you wake up in the morning and you know you've got to make a choice. And you say, well, I'll make a cup of coffee. You know, I'll, I'll look at my lamp. You know, maybe tomorrow. And then when you do make a choice, you finally make a choice, just think of the difficulties we have in accepting the consequences of that choice. Because, as you know, often choices don't lead to outcomes that we expected. And we screw up. We do screw up. And just think of what happens when you screw up and having to live with that. We find it much easier to make excuses. It wasn't my fault. That's not what I meant. I didn't really want to make that choice. So, by and large, there are these acts of evasions that we do. But at the end of the day, we recognize that freedom implies this element of subjectivity, of conscious choice, of, of being agents. We're not the objects of history. We're its subjects. We're prepared to take action and make history happen. And that was something, it seems to me, that's always been uh, really uh, very, very important. Now, I know that freedom can be a very scary experience, as I, as I said earlier on, but just for that reason, it, it still becomes quite significant and quite important. And I just want to kind of end up, more or less, by linking this discussion to what's going on today. The title of the lecture, uh, I don't know exactly what the title of the lecture is in, in, in Dutch or how you translated it, was Living with Fear in the Age of Terror. Right. Freedom in the Age of Terror. And one of the problems that I have is the fact that we talk about us living in an age of terror so easily. Right. Because who decided that you and I are living in an age of terror? I mean, where does that come from? Did God say, my children, you know, we are now living in an age of terror? You know, did somebody very holy and intelligent, make that pronouncement. Who, who decided that? Why, why can't we say, why cannot we decide that we live in an age of freedom? I mean, we as human subjects have got a capacity to make decisions about how we want to define our age. You know, what is it that we want to do? Why should we regard terror and the need to gain security for terror more important than moving freedom forward. It seems to me that we can make a decision, if we want to, to regard terror as a minor inconvenience. In other words, we can refuse to be terrorized. Yes, we know there are bad people out there doing very, very bad things, but we do not have to play the part that they assign to us. You know, we don't have to look, regard ourselves as walking tar targets. We don't have to look upon us as people who are there to be terrorized, like an audience in a horror film who's going to go away and pee in their pants because they're so scared. There's no need for us to, to, to react that way because we learn from history that whenever a, an act of terror occurs, whenever a bomb goes off, we can either react it by being terrorized or we can regard every single bomb, every time somebody gets shot or killed by a terrorist, as yet another argument for more freedom. Yet another argument that we have to be free, right? that it's important for us to maintain our freedom in the face of that, and therefore to take action that minimizes the risk and the consequences of terror. We have to limit that, but at the same time, we carry on freely without making the slightest possible concession. In other words, we do not need to trade in our freedom for security. On the contrary, we make a virtue of our freedom and, in, and, and demonstrate that precisely because we are free people, we're that much more able and that much more effective in dealing with these kinds of, uh, uh, kind of attacks upon our life. And that seems to me to be a, a much more uh, productive way of, of dealing with this. And similarly, I think it's important for us to take our freedom of speech much more, much more rigorously. I mean, I am worried that in European society, 
the, the, our, our capacity to express ourselves freely. Our freedom of speech is regarded in such a casual, promiscuous way. The ease with which people now say that you can't say that. These are words you can no longer use. Just this morning, I was doing a, a TV interview in, in, in England, and one of the things we were discussing are all the many, many words that you could use last year or 10 years ago, but now are not possible to express in good company. I mean, I express them, but I'm always in a bad company. And just the idea that somehow, you know, my language, my vocabulary, which I in a sense, developed for myself, needs to be subsumed to the censorship laws or the police who decides that they know better what is allowed and what is not allowed in terms of language. I think that's really quite important. And the reason why that's quite important is because we recognize very, very clearly that the freedom of speech is the one freedom that's different than any other freedom. The freedom of speech is logically prior to any other freedom, to the freedom of movement, to the freedom of uh, voting in an election, to any freedom. The freedom of speech is, is a foundational freedom. And the reason why freedom of speech is a foundational freedom is because unless you can have a voice, unless you can say what you want, unless you can express your aspirations, then not on the freedoms matter. You know, you might want more private rights, but unless you can voice a demand for more privacy, unless you can wage a critique against the attacks upon privacy, you're not going to be able to achieve that. Unless you can demand and argue for freedom of movement of people, there is going to be no freedom of movement of people because you haven't got the voice to say that. There is a, a book I read recently. I don't often read other people out because I know it's really boring. I do it in my university lecture, you know, sort of, and usually after two minutes, everybody is asleep, you know, sort of. But uh, I was really uh, absolutely uplifted because I wasn't expecting to read. You know what it's like when you find a really good book that you don't expect? It makes you that usually, you know, you, th the you think the book is going to be good and it's just, you know. I was going to use a bad word, but it's, it's, it's not particularly stimulating. But this book was written in 1946 by a man called Victor Golans, uh, who was a kind of a, a, a British leftist publisher. And he wrote a book in 1946 because he was really concerned about all the horrible things that happened during the Second World War and in the 1930s. And in this book, it's a book called Our Threatened Values. And it's something that really appeals to me because I do think that freedom is always a threatened value. You can never really uh, sort of uh, expect it to be there forever. And basically, what he says in this book, our threatened values, is two things. He first of all says, with freedom of speech, every other freedom is at any rate possible. Without it, all are in jeopardy. And I think he very clearly recognizes that with freedom of speech, all of our freedoms are possible. You take that away, the rest of our freedoms can easily be picked off one by one. And then more importantly, what he argues, and this is, a, to me, was a very you know, sort of encouraging affirmation of some of the ideas I've been working on. He argues very, very clearly that if we trade off our freedom for security, we become just like them. If we trade off our freedom of, for security because we're worried about the terrorists, we become you know, like the terrorist wants us to be. And this is what he says. He says, uh, he argues that if you silence fascists for fear that fascism will not be established, you have already half established it by the very fact of silencing them. In other words, the very fact that you're silencing the fascists or you want to silence them means that you've accepted their approach towards public life you begin to act and behave just like they do. In other words, you lose your moral authority. 
And what he was saying about the fascists, if you begin to silence the fascists, you become just like them, I think is not unlike what we're doing with radical Islamists in Europe, where instead of taking them on, challenging them, confronting them intellectually, morally, another way, for decades and decades and decades we pretended nothing was happening, you know, and then all of a sudden some problem occurs and we're too scared, we're too cowardly to actually engage and argue and debate and expose you know, what they really stand for, to actually have a, a proper battle of ideas, a proper political struggle. And that seems to me to be something that in a free society you would expect a free people to do. You don't just simply create these bubbles where people talk to only people like themselves. You get a clash of opinions and a clash of views. So, in a sense, it seems to me that what uh, uh, this guy was saying, what he is really arguing, is something that uh, we need to think about for ourselves. And the conclusions that I've come to in my old age, something that I, I feel more and more strongly about all the time, is that we have a responsibility. And our responsibility isn't just simply to talk about freedom. It isn't just simply to argue against examples of illiberal attempts to curb and limit freedom. I mean, all those things are really important. At the end of the day, the lessons that I've drawn from my experience is that the key thing that we need to establish is we have to learn to live freedom. We ourselves as individuals have got to set the example by living freely in our lives, by getting into the habit of making the choices that society demands on us, by putting ourselves on the line, experimenting, taking risks to some extent, and giving freedom a real content so that it ceases to be mere words on a paper, but acquires a real human, real humanist form of living existence. Thank you.